Ten years ago, we lost one of the greatest ultra cyclists the world has ever seen, Slovenian ultra racer and fan favorite Jure Robic. In his career, Jure won the famous Race Across America five times and held the 24-hour road record amongst his other 150 podium finishes and 100 race victories. Before ultra cycling, Jure was the Slovenian national road champion and served in the Slovenian army. On today's episode, we have the privilege of commemorating Jure's life with his former crew chief and longtime friend Matjaj Plenincek on the 10th anniversary of Jure's passing after a bicycle accident while training near his home. This is definitely one for the history books, and it's nothing short of inspirational. I'm your host, Justin Tu. Let's roll. <laughs> Hey, Ultra family, Justin Tu here, your host of the Ultra Cycling Show. Thanks for tuning in for this very special commemorative episode where we'll be speaking all about the life and cycling career of Jure Robic with his longtime friend and crew chief in his final Race Across America in 2010, Matjaj Plenincek. Matjaj? Hello, Justin. Thanks for joining yeah, me on the show you. today. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and and correct me, how do you say your Slovenian name? Matias. It's Matias Planinšek. I know it's hard to, to say it for every, <laughs> everybody except Slovenians probably. But a very nice name. And so I will make it a point to practice that. And perhaps next year in the commemoration of Jure, I'll be able to say it correctly. But here in the Western circles, I guess you go by Matt? Yeah, that was the easiest way. Okay. Uh, because I was I was talking a lot with uh, the race officials from Race Across America. Remember me that we were talking a lot. So mm. Matt is easier. All right, I like that. Very very westernized name, Matt. So from this uh, point forward, I will refer to you as Matt if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. So Matt, you were Yuri's longtime friend. Tell me a little bit about that before we dive into everything else. Yeah, we when he was leaving uh, road cycling, we, we met and I don't know how it came exactly. We stayed for all his uh, ultra cycling uh, uh, attempts and, and races and uh, wins and loses and stuff like that uh, from uh, his first... Uh, 24-hour 24, 24 time trial as a world record attempt as a qualifier for Race Across America. And we stayed together for all the, almost all the races. I was missing only once in 2007. Otherwise, I was with him in all, in all crews for his Race Across Americas. Mm, incredible. I have some photos that you graciously sent through, as well as one of the photographers, Chert Slavic. <laughs> Really appreciate that. There's a lot of action shots showing Jure in his finest. And of course, many in the ultra cycling world know him very well. He's a five-time Ram winner, has been on the podium 150 times in his races and won 100 of them. There are also photos that you sent in. You were involved with seven of his eight Race Across Americas including as a crew chief in his final one in 2010. So that's excellent. Now, I did pull up his Wikipedia page, and of course, he does have a lot of useful information there. I'd love to discuss more about his life as a soldier in the Slovenian army. And then, of course, your involvement with him in the race across America. Again, he won five times, and that was the men's record at the time, only bested now by Christoph Strausser. How did you get involved with the Race Across America? And how did the Slovenian army come into play with uh, Jure's uh, races? I was involved first, firstly with his uh, qualifier, Ram qualifier. And then when he qualified for Race Across America, he was building his crew out of people he knew. So entrusted, probably. Um, so that we would be his uh, helpers on the first race across America. Um, he was already, in, I believe he was already employed in Slovenian army. 
uh, and he tried to get into Slovenian army as a sportsman uh, into Slovenian army. Slovenian army has this program employing uh, sportsmen and uh, women and men and try to support them through, his, through their sporting career with just, uh, I don't know, giving him wages and uh, social security and stuff. Mm. Uh, they, were, they were like, I don't know, they were just, they were, they are presenting Slovenian army but not really being as a soldier. But Yuri was different because ultra cycling is not a recognized sport. And he was not deemed to be, I don't know, very successful sportsman, just a guy who is trying to cross the United States on a bicycle in the shortest possible time. And then they, they give him a chance uh, that he can qualify as a professional soldier, as a soldier, soldier. Imagine that in his age, I don't know, 40 or it was like, I don't know if he's 65, so it would be 35 or something. In his age of 35, he was qualifying as a soldier for the Slovenian army with people aging 20, 21, 22. And he was doing these hard tests on the, in the, on the military comp, uh, grounds and uh, running around with the, with the weapon and I don't know what, what else they are doing. And at the, in the evening, he was also running for 10 kilometers just for the training. And he was 10 or more years older than him. And then he was accepted regularly into Slovenian army. And when he was accepted, he got uh, status in the, uh, in the sports unit. Uh -huh. And then when he was in the sports unit, the army supported him in a way that they sent uh, more than half of the crew, people, uh, ingredients for the crew, from their units uh, and paying them so that uh, those guys were not uh, on U.S. expense. Wow, incredible. That was, that's how it was much easier for him. And the Army also paid for the vehicles, paid for the, the traveling expenses for their employees. And that's how the, the, the filling the budget, meeting the budget of the race across America for Europe was much easier with the Slovenian Army in, uh, in the picture. Okay, that's very interesting to learn. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. It's it's great that that Yure did have that option because of course he was a very talented ultra cyclist, and in fact he was also on the Slovenian national cycling team right from 1988 to 1994, and during that time he was also the Slovenian national road champion. So definitely a talented athlete and cyclist, and so it was an investment well spent. And of course now just globally he is he's very well known and. He always put on a great race, especially here in the race across America. And so, of course, you were involved with seven out of eight of his race across Americas. So I'm sure there was a lot that you learned about him as a person, as an ultra cyclist. And even, I suppose, as a soldier, I'm sure a lot of those disciplines, a lot of those talents, that mental strength came out as well, right? Yeah, definitely. But he was... Um... Let's say he was a very good ultra cyclist and he could be a really good soldier anytime, even with his, I don't know, age of 40 or something. He was so well prepared. So that was not a problem for him. Um, and also denying the pain, that was one of his, I don't know, qualities. And during the pain and then actually denying it, and it also comes handy if you are a soldier. Mm. You did send me this nice image with this quote from Yuri, pain doesn't exist for me. I know it's there, but I don't pay attention to it. I believe this picture and this quote was published in Slovenian edition of Playboy. He was interviewed in the Slovenian edition of Playboy. And, and <laughs> if I remember correctly, that was in it. Wow. And yeah, that was him. He would, he would usually say, you know, after getting out of the bed, after 23 hours of riding, one hour or something sleeping and then getting out of the bed he sat on the bike and said this is this is a lot of there's a lot of pain doing that after only that short amount of time sleeping and then sitting back on the bike mm. and he said then i just sit on the bike harder and i just try to forget the pain and i just push on wow and that was him. incredible and talking about sleep i did i did read online that in his 2014, or rather, in his 2004 race across America, it was reported that he only slept for a total of eight hours during his eight days of, of riding. So that, yeah, that would be, I don't, I don't know who recorded that, 
probably he said it in the interview, but it's uh, probably very close to the truth. Mm -hmm. Because after the start, uh, Race Across America usually starts in midday on the first day. Mm -hmm. And on the first night, nobody, nobody of those uh, first place contenders will not go to sleep. They're all looking at each other uh, when the first one will go to sleep. And then the second night, the first one, they are all going to sleep after ride, around 36 or 40 hours of riding and then go to sleep. And then they sleep maybe six or seven times only days. And that will go like in eight hours altogether. But uh, this is probably sleeping in as a sleeping. And then you have to add to that, uh, I don't know, a lot of uh, power slips. That that was done maybe once or twice a day for 15 minutes, just laying down in the shade. And he would just lay down and shut down for 15 minutes and then wake up and push on. But that's not in that eight hours. I would say, I would say eight hours plus power slips. Mm. Yeah, and of course, you were his crew chief in the final year, but you were a part of his crew for almost every time that he did the race across America. So I'm sure you're very familiar with his schedule and also keeping him on track to be successful. Now, before we dive into more about Yure, I did want to pause to mention for those who don't know, unfortunately, Yure did. Uh, Yure was involved in an accident in 2010, in fact, September 24th. And he was busy training for the Crocodile Trophy mountain bike ultra race in Australia, right? Tell me a bit about what had happened there and what he was training towards. He was actually mountain biking. That's a, a route close to his home. And looking at the pictures, I was not there when he crashed or let's say in half an hour after that, I saw pictures taken from that uh, place and seeing the location later it's a light it's a light left bend going downhill on the dirt road and there was just a car opposite i i would say that the guy driving that car was not actually able to do anything because yuri came in fast and as the mountain bike lay down and i crashed a few times with the mountain bike i know how it looks if you brake on the front on the front uh, too hard and the front wheel would just go left or right from you and you would dive in straight in uh, and the bike would stay behind you and actually you dived down with his head and he hit the front bumper with his head and i believe that car was even moving and also uh, driving with that left front left wheel over him wow. so he would be dead immediately if he would not be braking that hard, he would probably fly over the car and maybe broken a lot of bones, but survived. But, you know, mm. it's a little bit late for that now. Right. It was, um, it was actually, he was killed as he was riding the bike, full mm. on. Mm. No, no, um, I don't know, no braking, no too much braking, just full on. He was training, riding hard. I was in that car. I remember the race. I think it's called the race across the Alps. Mm. It's uh, it's a distance race across the Alps, many hill climbs, uh, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, and it. I think it runs for 40, 45 hours or something. It's an ultra race. But how he descended on the downhills, and we were descending in the van behind him, it was scary watching and scary sitting in in the van. It was. I don't know. I when I saw when I saw how he died, I remember those scenes how he was riding on the bike. So, well, you know, he he said when we were asking him how what you will, what will you do and when you because the army kicked him off, and what will you do after that? How, we even started a, a small web shop with his goods, you know, with his uh, jerseys and t-shirts and stuff like that. Hmm. And during the last time, even even we made it some kind of money for him, you know, as as a I don't know as a profit. And we asked him, "What will you do after those races? Hmm. Don't worry, it will sort it out." <laughs> and he did, you know, in, in, a, in a green Incredible. black way. But it sorted out, you know. He was he was living for that bicycle, and you know, till the end. Hmm. Well, that's, that's great to hear that he was able to do what he loved till the very end. Thank you for sharing that. 
we were chatting earlier and you did explain to me that in the Slovenian army, once you reach the age of 45 years old, then uh, you can no longer serve. And uh, that was the case there with Yure in his final year in 2010, when he was hit by the car in September, September 24th. But of course, a few months before that was his final ram and you were his crew chief. And so I'd love to learn about that experience, you know, him as an athlete and and all of those things. But before that, I thought it'd be fun, just as we usually do, we start every episode with a sprint round of questions. Now, typically for the athlete, but I thought this might be a nice test for you, Matt, and to see how well you remember uh, your rider. And now some of these questions might be more challenging than others, so don't feel bad, and no one's going to keep score, I hope. <laughs> okay. Okay, Matt. So first question. Do you know how long Yure had been riding bicycles? Oh, I believe from his age of six or something like that, because um, his story is that uh, his mom riding him over the mountain pass, Vršić, close to quite legendary in Slovenian cycling. And he saw those uh, cyclists uh, riding downhill with those cycling bikes and said, I want to do that. And I believe it was very early age. That's so cool. I, I, let's say if you're asking me uh, s- s- riding road bikes, I would say from the age 10 or something, the regular road bikes. Wow, incredible. And you mentioned his mother. Is, uh, is his mother still alive? Uh, unfortunately not. He died before him. Mm, okay. A few years before him, out of cancer. Mm, sorry for that loss. That's very difficult. I actually just recently lost my mother to cancer, so I know all about that struggle. But I'm sure Yure was very strong, and I'm sure that also motivated him for some of his races, I'd imagine. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. How long was Yure an ultra cyclist? When was his first ultra race? Okay, the run was 2003, obviously, and the last one was 2010. But what, what else can you count uh, for the older cycling? It's, if it's a crocodile trophy, I don't know exact year, but I would say a few years before. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's good. Okay. But, uh, the attempts for the, for the, for the, if the ultra cycling is also, if ultra cycling is your uh, qualifiers, it was, those were done in 2002, I believe. Hmm. The first attempt was uh, 2001 on, uh, in, in the Holland. And then due to bad weather, we had to abandon that. And I believe in 2002, he qualified. Probably, right. but you know. <laughs> Sounds I'm believable not sure. to me. <laughs> okay, yeah. how many bicycles did Yure have at the time? At the same time or uh, um, during the... Yeah, well, how about both? At, the, at any one time, and then how about in all the time that you n- knew him? Can you estimate? He would, he would um, I would say, during his ultra cycling career, he would keep probably only two bikes. Hmm. I would say one, the racing one, and the other one was always on the trainer. Ah. If, there was be, if there would be a third bike, he would be on, that bike would, that bike would be on sale. Because he was always, always short with money, you know, in... Mm. He was trying to sell to sell the bike when he didn't need it anymore. He sell it. Mm. He would sell it, and then I would say two bikes at the same time. But uh, through all the years, he was changing. At first, um, at the end, the Scott USA, the Scott Sports today, was his uh, sponsor for the last I don't know half of the race across America. But at first, there were guys uh, from uh, Holland, also uh, sponsors. And if you ask me now the names, I'm very sorry, those guys, if they're, if they're watching, I don't remember those Dutch names, as yeah. as you will not remember mine, probably. <laughs> um, but those guys were really, um, Rob Stanks. Rob Stinks, Stanks, something like that. Mm-hmm. Rob Stanks has a bicycle shop in uh, Holland, and he was sponsoring him mm-hmm. out of Holland, building bikes for him, uh, for Jure, and Jure was racing first, first, first race across America, definitely. I don't know about the second. But the first race across America was sponsored by Rob Stanks with his bike shop and his, uh, because it was custom built uh, cycling bike, road bike. Wow. Sounds great. Now, of all the bikes that he ever rode, do you know which was his favorite bicycle? I don't know. Probably the current one was his favorite. 
I don't believe it that he uh, was uh, having any feelings for past bikes, the current bikes mm. were his. He, he, one bike is all, was also sold on the race across America after the finish to oh. uh, Mount Avery Bike Shop Museum. I believe there's a bike museum also in a big uh, a truck trailer. And uh, the guy bought the bike under the Ure, actually, after the, after the race. Wow. So he was not really, you know, keeping those bikes. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope he sold that only after his finish was official. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you finish, you finish, you know, you cannot, uh, when you, when you cross the, the final line, if, you know, it's done, you know, you will not do it again. This <laughs> that year. Right. Okay. So in training or just in the race across America, was he tracking metrics or were you as his crew chief tracking things like his power? Uh, or his he had rate? a special, he had an old school paper book. Like, uh, you know, Marco Balog is also talking a lot about that book. Hmm. Those guys, they have books, paper books, and they write down whole old trainings from day one. You know, they were taught as a, as a kid. Hmm. They have to track all their trainings and those trainings were done are there in those books. I don't know where Yuri's book actually is, probably with his son, hmm. the older son, I would I would think, you know, because one I had there was one attempt me for me to to you know just type it into a kind of a, I don't know a Excel or something. I was doing that for a few months and you know if when reading that you know you got sick you know that's so much training you know in yeah. such a bad weather during winter you don't believe it you know he was riding really riding running walking in deep snow i don't know doing everything mm. so much that it's crazy yeah i would I, be I, nice I, to see it yeah i, I agree now you mentioned his son what one of these uh, was is his son right yeah, on his right is his son. On his left is my son. They are uh, oh, okay. more or less the same age. Okay, but they're yeah. older now, right? How old were they in this picture? Yeah. Uh, those kids are 16 this year. Ah, I see. So mine is already 16, but yours uh, now will be in November, I believe, 16. Incredible. This is, this is, I believe this picture is done 20 days or something before his death. Wow. Because I think on that day, we spoke about his brother also dying because his brother committed a suicide, I believe, one month before, before a year is dead. And we were just talking about what, what was, what was wrong. What was, what was his brother thinking? What, why he did it? And so on. We, we were talking about that. And I believe it's on that day. Mm. I, as I remember it as it was on that day. So it, it's a month before. Now, does his son ride bicycles at all? And what's his son's name? <laughs> yeah, he, he is riding bicycles, all right. But um, he started as a road cyclist and then a mountain bike. And then I believe then it was, uh, again, road cycling. Currently, he's riding mountain bikes, but I would say more jumping and flying mountain bikes. Hmm. He's, uh, I think his discipline in mountain bike today is enduro. Um, but he wants to do all all things, you know. He wants to be a mountain mountain rescue guy. He yeah. wants to do all the stuff extreme. <laughs> I I don't know if he would be if he will be ever uh, a ultra cyclist, but you never know. It's, <laughs> yeah, I guess it runs. In you the, can the see you in him partly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And what's his name? And also, he admires his father, Nal. No. Now, Robert, N -A -L. the next question I have for you, Matt, is what was Yuri's favorite ride snack? What would you be feeding him and what would he look forward to when he was racing across America? Pancakes. Wow. Pancakes was the, his favorite. When you show him pancakes, you know, it was <laughs> dive in, you know, yeah. all 10 fingers in. Uh, Yuri was really hard uh, to keep away from food when racing. Hmm. It was not that easy. <laughs> because he he would love probably all the ultra cyclists love to eat uh, hard food usual normal food mm. and we as as i know as i heard we were not uh, i thought at first i thought every crew has their own cook mm. but uh, later i heard that that's not the case 
we always had a guy dedicated to be a cook. And that guy was cooking, uh, let's say, our standard in our crews were always, from the day one, was one hot meal for the every crew member a day. One hot meal, mm. not much. But everything else was done for Yure. And when he was, those guys were doing pancakes uh, while the motorhome was driving. You now they devised a procedure that I believe the number was 40 miles per hour on cruise control. And the cook can still make pancakes in the back. <laughs> that's how that's how they roll. Nice. Okay. We also we always had this dedicated crew for the for the motorhome. Three guys. One was cooking, and two were actually exchanging on, behind the wheel and doing all the, the. That was our you know army kitchen, all the hmm. time moving across America. And you know <laughs> it's it's really you know like in every army you know the the really uh, morale boost is it's good food. When you get when you got off, off the bike and somebody was just hand, handing uh, pancakes to him or maybe a pasta or something, he was always smiling. And also all the crew members were the same. You know, we, we, when you were off the shift, somebody would give you the something to eat, and the the all the the day was different from that moment. So we were like that. You know, and so I cool. believe pancakes is the answer. <laughs> really fun memories. Thanks for sharing that with us. Did he have a favorite kind, or were they just plain pancakes? Did they have something in them? Yeah, pancakes, them? but I believe they're 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 built cooked differently than in America. They are wider and thinner, mm. and with jelly on it. Oh, okay. Then again, don't don't. Uh, I'm not sure if the jelly was his favorite filling for the for the pancakes. That's that I will not uh, bet my money on it. So. Okay. Was it something closer along the lines of like a French crepe or like a Danish pancake, like thinner? Yeah, maybe French crepe. Yeah, we, we, they're much wider. and mm. That's the way the pancakes are made in Slovenia. That's, oh, okay. You know. Yeah, it sounds delicious. Not like here in the U.S. where you're, it looks like a big thick steak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes ten of them uh, stacked uh, together, and then you know it's one by one, yeah. really thin and rolled together. Ah, oh, sounds delicious. We'll have to grab some after this uh, chat. <laughs> okay, what was Yuri's favorite hydration during his races? So that was probably changing uh, according to the current sponsor. Hmm. And that would. Uh, that's you know, I don't know. <clears throat> That's beyond me. I, don't know. <laughs> I was not enough. doing the food and drink stuff. There was always different okay. guys in the crew. So yeah, okay. So during the race, he was really enjoying his Slovenian pancakes. But how about like after the race was all said and done? You know, he's been riding for eight nine days. What was his favorite post ride meal? What would he look forward to after a long hard race or long hard training? <laughs> Yeah, tough questions, but all I remember him eating, you know, even when uh, meeting him is in his apartment, he was always eating pasta, and he was eating pasta with uh, only uh, some olive oil and grana padano cheese, mm. without any sauce, anything, you know. All I remember his kitchen, you know, every cabinet you open, either it was uh, hydration uh, powder or mm. uh, cycling bottles or pasta. <laughs> He he lived simply. He did he didn't yeah. need it much, you know, and also a lot of fruit and stuff like that. Mm. He was not complicated uh, regarding food, as I remember. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, do you remember if Yure enjoyed the climbs, the sense rollers, or the flats? Never the flats. Mm. Never. You know, Kansas was a nightmare. Mm. You know, when we entered Kansas, you know, it was like you know. Uh, Entering the twilight zone, you know, if, <laughs> if when you when you hit Kansas and you have a headwind, you know, oh my God, yeah. I mean, that's that's really hard for you because we you Yure was never riding the flats. We don't have flats. Every you <clears throat> let's say in Virginia, West Virginia, uh, the let's say in the Palachians, that uh, eastern part of United States are very similar to Slovenian landscape. Because everything is going down, up and down, left and right, and everything is green. Mm. That's that's uh, that. Those places were reminding you of Slovenia, and I believe that was his favorite. Uh, that was his favorite uh, favorite terrain for uh, racing. 
otherwise he he didn't mind climbs but climbs in rockies are really long and hard and mm. when you look at them they don't see really hard because the the roads are wide and everything is so widely spread and right. <clears throat> you think it's this is not really steep because if you if you compare that to slovenians or or uh, in in the alps the climbs are really the, the roads are tight and turns mm. are tight and steep and Makes I sense. would say the rollers. <clears throat> okay, interesting. So you like the rollers out here. You were talking about West Virginia, just showing yeah, yeah. an example of the Race Across America course, of course, starting here in Oceanside, California, going diagonally through. You're going through Arizona. You just skirt through Utah there. And then, of course, Colorado, where the Rocky Mountains are. And you talked about the flat plains of Kansas there. Yeah, after, after the Rocky Mountains. Yep. I think is it Kuchara Pass or something like that is the last one. Right. And then you are then you are on two thousand meters elevation and everything goes flat. And mm. at first at first it goes down and then uh, that's nice if it's go down and flat and you, you, you go really fast. But when you hit Kansas it gets more humid and uh, hotter and flat. And corn, 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 corn. I, all I remember <laughs> is corn. Right. And in there is uh, everything depends on the wind. If yep. the wind is from behind, you get through it really fast. But if not, it's suffering. And then right. looking at the map, uh, when crossing Missouri River, different terrain starts, and that's that's more. Uh, according to your taste he was always saying if somebody would be close to him i would lose him after missouri hmm. makes sense as you were discussing in missouri and in all the <clears throat> hills is very similar to the terrain there in slovenia so that makes sense of course in kansas the roads are so straight. Once you make a, a turn, you'll be on it for 50 miles or 75 miles in a very long time. So if there's a headwind or even a crosswind, it's not a very pleasant. Or when you, yeah, or when you are uh, behind somebody, but you will be, you would be maybe one hour behind somebody, right. but you will see amber light <laughs> of of his follow up vehicle, right. and you thought it's really close, but no, it's one hour behind during the night. It's yeah. <clears throat> crazy. <laughs> Okay, Matt, do you know what your race max speed has been going down a hill? You did mention he, it was scary following him when you were doing different races. Do you have any idea? I don't, I don't know the, the top speed ever recorded. I don't know, but it would be more than 100 kilometers per hour, definitely. Mm, yeah, definitely. So over 60 miles per hour, definitely yeah. fast. And he was comfortable on those descents and I guess it makes sense so as a mountain bike racer that he was technically very good at going down. Now there in Slovenia, I'm not familiar with the weather there, but do you know when Jure enjoyed riding the most in terms of a season, fall, winter, spring or summertime? That I would have to guess, but uh, spring and fall definitely. In the summer it's, it's quite hot, but it depends on the summer. Mm. But he would ride. He would ride also in the winter when it was would be snowing and raining and freezing cold and wow. stuff like that. But I would say he enjoyed like like all of us, you know, uh, when it's dry but not too hot. Mm. Fall and uh, spring. Yeah, definitely. Now I know he trained a lot, and especially he was doing a lot of indoor miles, especially during the winter times. But do you know if he preferred a certain time of day to ride, like in the morning, afternoon, or evening? Oof. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, I would say though, uh, his trainings were six, eight hours long. So, you know, starting in the morning, uh, finishing in the evening. <laughs> but when uh, close to the race across America, uh, trying to prepare for that race, he did special trainings, you know, doing the, the whole day training and then not sleeping at all during the night and then going to training in the morning again and the next night probably riding during the night, such kind of combinations. So uh, I would say he used the whole day for, for riding. Yeah, that makes sense. So what would you say 
he would think, or what was his philosophy about ultra cycling? Do you think Yure thought that ultra cycling required more physical or mental training? Um, his belief was that you have to train hard at first. You have to train hard and harder and harder. He, he used to say, uh, I'm better because I train harder. And at the end, when, when let's say a few guys train hard and they're close together, and then mental mental um, strength is probably decisive. But uh, I believe even more his ability to endure pain was the one. Mm. I don't know. when. When he was really challenged on one on one in uh, in uh, race across America, I believe uh, his uh, advantages were after asleep. You know, uh, his regeneration capabilities were probably better than of the other of his competition. Hmm. So that's that's why probably bit by bit every day on every after every night he was a bit better than the others and that's my opinion but i was never a coach so mm. i would say that's my uh, just now, my opinion now on your race, race across americas how many people would typically be on his crew and what were some of the roles <laughs> in the crew we it's a yeah, it's an interesting story actually because what we started in two thousand and three by then crew chief Milan Stanovic, he said none of us knows what race across, race across America is because we were all rookies, all rookies with Yure, but he did a lot of maybe similar events in different sports, so he knew how to organize us, and then we set up the the um, let's say the organization which probably stayed more or less the same through all that, those years. But the first philosophy was if you have one follow-up vehicle, you have three guys inside and you have to have two spares for that car. So five guys are rotating in that in that car. And then you have three guys in the motorhome, which are also, like I said, one is cooking and two are actually exchanging uh, behind the wheel. And that's eight guys. And you need what you need is eight guys with two vehicles. Sometimes if, if you have the budget, if you have people, you add the third vehicle into which you put two or three guys to cover it. So we would typically run uh, eight or 11. Mm. Sometimes we would have, sometimes we would have <clears throat> a guy <clears throat> with us who paid his own uh, travel expenses and just a little bit help us. That was the, the idea with you with to get the crew. But we, the crew members, then had this problem with those guys because they were not really trying to to work the the crew duties, just to be there you know, on the trip or doing whatever, recording something with they what they need for their own business and stuff. Like that. Right. <clears throat> it was not always easy. Very interesting. So, how how did you find crewing for Yuri? Was he pretty pretty calm? Pretty easy to to take care of. Yeah, probably one of the hardest. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Uh, after the first race across America, I was like, you know, I'm not going. I'm not going again. No way. I'm not going again. And after a month, <laughs> okay, okay, maybe. And after two or three months, he would ask me, okay, I, uh, okay, I'm going. And that was every year the same. <clears throat> uh, he was not easy. Definitely not. When he was riding 100%, he was also demanded, demanding 100%, and was not really. But the worst thing about him was that he was not really thinking about what crew is doing or what the crew needs to be done. He thought only, I have to train, and that's it. Everything else will just happen. And you know, he had to organize some stuff before departure to to race across America, but he did he did that only partially and later on we figured out that uh, everything around except cycling everything else had to be done by other people otherwise we are you know, doomed on the race um, so uh, he was actually thinking only of uh, cycling training and that's it everything else was done by others and then would when when others were like hundred percent in or I don't know all in 
working hard and then he would like ask something because he didn't like say what we see stupid questions because he didn't uh, actually give a thought about how this eight or eleven people behind him is actually organized how they are organized he would never think about it and then asking stupid questions and then you know we were tired he was tired and then we were yelling at each other you know, in the, on the first race across america he took a spare bike with him for which he knew it's not his size but oh yeah, that's the one i have and then the main bike got uh, broken and he was given the spare bike and then uh, after i don't know how many kilometers he threw that uh, he stopped and he said, he, I will not ride anymore because this bike is not okay. But man, you brought it. You, you, it was your <laughs> responsibility to get the, the spare bike. And that's it. You have only this bike. Uh, and then, I don't know, he maybe misheard me or I don't know what exactly I said. He threw the bike into the ditch. <laughs> and that was like, you know, I was... Uh, and then I went to the ditch, br brought back to the road on the road the bike and said to him that I was not... I didn't get here just to see him throwing bikes in the ditch. And I just said, get on that bike and ride as long as we say you should ride. And then we will repair you and let us repair the main bike. And he was just staring at me and just said, I will say, I will say, I will say the English translation. He said, yes, sir. And he sat on the bike and he was riding. Probably he was, I don't know, uh, very tired, not sleepy, not sleeping. Mm. And he would be really, you know, maybe he didn't hear me right. I don't know. Everything was really messed up. We were like angry. Mm. He, he was angry on me. I was angry on him. But a few hours later, he got his main back, his main bike back, but not thanks to him because he didn't have any spare parts with him, not any tools. And we were actually asking other crews to to lend us spare parts and other crews to lend us mechanics. And that's what we learned in 2003, because we trusted him to bring the bikes, <laughs> the tools, and the spare parts. None of this yeah. happened. He only oh. brought himself. And a... he, he finished second on that year. Wow. So the next year was different, you know? Mm. And if you ask me, the last year was much, much, much different. It was an evolution of how the crew works. Yeah, that's a that's a cool story. Very very fun story. Thanks for sharing that. I'm sure you and your and the rest of the crews would always laugh about those memories, especially towards the end, as you mentioned. It sounds like some of the the common issues that crews do face, and one of the challenges of a multi day event like the Race Across America, because it's not just about the riding, although that is very difficult to train for and to do the sleep deprivation, all the elements, but the logistics. Yeah having an excellent crew but it does sound like he did have a great crew in yourself and in everyone else and he was also cooperative as best as he could through the sleep deprivation and it's cool to to hear that from those kinds of places you know you may look at someone like Yure who won the race cross market five times and think he just had it all together since the beginning but the truth is that he started the same as the rest of all of us did learning the hard way a lot of the times uh, along the ways. And you, of course, were part of his Race Across America seven times. So I'm sure every time was just a bit better than the last time. And so what were some of your own personal highlights from all of your Race Across Americas with you, Ray? The first thing I think is the last Race Across America when also me, what we did on that race, you know, how the crew functioned. and trying to fix all the mistakes how you erased how we handled all the problems how we understood each other in the crew it was like close to perfection for me but if i say to all the people who actually were on the race across america know how how hard it is to organize everything race across america starts mid-june 13 15 16 17. on may 1st I got the phone call before May 1st. I didn't know anything about we are that we are going to race across America because on April 15th, he was 45 years and they kicked him out of the army. And that was a shock. And then like, we are not going to race across America. We did nothing regarding preparations before that. <laughs> nothing during the fall, nothing, nothing, nothing. The whole winter was, we are not going to race across America. There is no money. 
there is no crew, and we are not going to race across America. On May 1st, I remember myself laying in the couch. I got a phone call, and you recalled me and said, we are going to race across America. And I say, yeah, right, okay. Do we have a crew? And he said, I have you. <laughs> okay, I'm only one. Do we have a doctor? Yes, we have a doctor. Do we have a mechanic? Yes, we have a mechanic. And then the next thing was find another five guys. And we didn't have any actually new guys. We Most of the crew was always from the back, veterans. And the last year, we have only two guys who, who were actually friends of Yure, and they, they offered to pay their own expenses, and they were uh, running the motorhome. Mm. Otherwise, all, all of them are veterans. So when Yure said, okay, we have that, and then try to get a um, motorhome, let's say the one 30, 32 feet long, the one that you will pick up in California and return it in uh, on the East Coast, and get it for uh, reasonable money, less than five thousand dollars at that time. You know, it's impossible. It's only one month before, and I was quite a few nights. I was on the phone trying to get the motorhome because the motorhome is is everything. Mm. To get it, even it was not the question of how cheap you can get it. To get it, it was the problem. <laughs> and we managed to set up the team, to set up the logistics, to set up the equipment in fifth in uh, let's say forty five days. 40 wow. days actually we were there five days before uh, ram start we were there it's i don't know but it was not incredible people listening now uh, doing also that and they're preparing probably from the past summer and they still don't know what did they need and will they need that will they need, will they need this and even imagine all of us coming from overseas we have to rent everything it's not that you ask a friend to let and your motorhome, you have to rent it. You have to, you have to trust all the services that they will be there. When if you if you let's say arrange that on a certain day there will be a motorhome, it has to be a right size of the motorhome on the right day over there. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't race. Right. And it's not that easy. And uh, we did that in what thirty something, forty days, and we started, and everything went smoothly actually on from the day one you know the highlight it's not even racing the vehicle and bicycle ex, uh, inspection on the parking lot in on previous years there were also a lot of flaws from our side because like i said you did not pay didn't pay any anything those uh, to attention to those to those details mm. because he was all racing he didn't care if if you have all that paperwork done if you have all that uh, signage on the on the bicycle on the right the right side the right amount he was just cycling and we also always had problems with with race officials that we have to do that we have to do this and and my my idea was from day one from contact number one on the race with race officials would be inspection and we will do that 100 percent and i remember us all going in black t-shirts your aerobic team on it everything was orchestrated everybody knew what to do and i believe those race officials from that year they will remember uh, that it was something completely different in your rubbish team this year, that year so that's pretty cool from from that moment on we just did it you know your mm -hmm. plan was to break a record but it was not uh, possible because of the the weather because we we were actually caught by floods uh, floods and the road were roads were stopped mm. blocked and we were we were waiting at that at those blockades to to get the reroute and stuff like that this is i don't know if it's the same year but um this happened you know uh if if there if that would be a video we would roll it back 15 minutes two turns behind he was doing a power slip and while he wake up wakes up and goes on the bike he runs and the guys from the crew would be just, uh, you know, rolling the the mat, the mats and stuff, putting into the van and mm. behind him. And after the turn, we see this: mm. you're riding bicycle in 20 centimeters deep water, let's almost a foot, and just um, not turning the full cycle with his legs, and just doing like this so his feet would not get wet. <laughs> and he didn't stop before that water; he just entered the water and just go, goes through, you know. It's, Nothing will stop him. You know? <laughs>
And later we were thinking about what if something would be inside, like potholes or I don't know, stones or branches or snakes or whatever. I don't know what. We don't know what to expect from wildlife because you don't, know, <laughs> yeah. you don't even know where you are. Yeah. Yeah, well, some of the exciting adventures of the Race Across America, but it seems like that year, man, I can't believe you got everything orchestrated within just 30 something days. And of course, you did make it successfully, and everyone is very happy here at the finish line, right? That picture, you know, it's that picture says everything, you know, for us who did it, you know, it's, it's over here on, on the wall, I have it. Uh, enlarged and you know i can turn the computer and you can see it no oh, cool. it doesn't look but okay oh, yeah. um that picture is everything you know we did it mm. everybody's happy we did it and it's done so that picture you can see that ram's story of yuri rovich is done you know we sat on the bench after maybe one day later when we were waiting other riders to come in and we were only me and Yuri. We were uh, talking to each other, and we were actually concluding the conversation in a way that Yuri actually admitted that this is it. You know, mm. that's it. I, this is for me. Ram is over because what we what we found out during those years that his body was actually breaking more oftenly than before. Uh, mm. The last uh, race across America, he has. Um, I don't know how it's called in English, but uh, fractured, fractured uh, muscle, broken muscle in the in one of the ties, mm. and well, the doctor was keeping this at the normal state with this uh, kinesio tapes stuff like that, so Yuri would be actually able to go over the last climb. Mm. Um, the name of that climb I don't remember, but it's really steep mm. at the end of the race across America, and we were afraid if if let's say if competition would know that Yura is, let's say, let's say breaking, they would attack if they would be close enough. But um, we were just, you know, we said after that climb, he can roll into the Annapolis with one leg. And after that climb, we were actually celebrating, you know, because for us, that was it. You know? He just needs to roll down to Annapolis. Mm. That must have been a fun memory. Yeah, he was a strong rider and has a lot of accomplishments to his name. What would you say for Yure? What motivated him to keep coming back? Not just to keep training there in Slovenia for hours on end every day, but then to have to, you know, try to get a whole crew over here, battle all those elements. You know, he was on the older end of of some of the competitors that he had. So there was a lot that he was faced uh, that he had to battle against. What kept him motivated? Very interesting question. I don't know. I believe he was everything on the race across America. Like you said, he was the king at that time. You know, mm. Every time he, he actually registered for the race, Guys from from media, they were just joking like, "Okay, the competition for second place is now open because like Yuri would always always win." He was everything. He was not a star, but he was everything. He was the king of race across America. But at home, he needed that you know that confirmation. Although people knew him, he was not really a celebrity or something with his race across America uh, wins, but. Um, I believe he felt really good when coming to race across America and showing everybody that he's the best. Mm. That's that was his motivation. He liked that feeling mm. to be to, to, to win. He found himself in ultra cycling and he could probably win a whole lot of ultra cycling races beside race across America. Let's say he was thinking about after leaving race across America to race uh, let's locally in Europe races for one, two days long and just try to, to win some more and stuff like that. Mm. But the race across America was for him was the ultimate ultra cycling event, which is, and to win there is showing everybody else that he's the best. Mm. That was probably his motivation to keep that position, to be, to showing that he's still the best, still the best. 
Yeah, Yuri was definitely an inspirational ultra cyclist and still inspiring many today. I know in addition to his incredible performances at the Race Cross America, he did also at the time hold the 24-hour road record. He bicycled 518.7 miles nonstop. He also won Le Tour Direct in seven days, 19 hours and 40 minutes. That was about 2,500 miles on a course that was derived from the classic Tour de France route. And of course, he did the race across Slovenia on a number of occasions, the Tour yeah. Tour. So he was definitely an accomplished cyclist in general. But of course, with the Race Across America, the most difficult ultra cycling event in the world, he was number one. Yeah. He also liked uh, Race Across Slovenia was probably one of his favorite, his local race. And also that race, uh, uh, let's say, brought a lot of uh, European uh, all, and also, you know, American riders to that race because Jure Robic was riding that race, race across, race uh, around Slovenia, it's not across, across is too short, <laughs> uh, around, you can get, you know, 1,200 and something kilometers with a lot, a lot of climbs. Mm. And the race was really attractive for riders all over the world because Jure was always racing there. And he was always racing there. And that race is mm. one month and let's say in the beginning of May before the race across America. And partly also because of that race, winning that race in local in Slovenia, he was known in Slovenia and that was a part of his popularity. Mm. Very cool. Now, Matt, tell me about this photograph here that you shared with us. Um, after his death, uh, we found out Yuri Robich Foundation. But uh, and one of the ideas in this foundation was to, to give away um, bicycles for, uh, let's say, poor, chil poor, poor children. Um, the idea was... But we didn't have any a lot of money because we did those actions like a few times and we like around five bikes every time we were giving out. Five bikes, five helmets. And the kids were picked up by, uh, let's say we would uh, pick up, pick out the, the location, one town, and then contact the schools. And those social workers in the schools would know exactly who needs, who needs a good bike, who really needs a good bike. Because we were not, uh, we, our idea was to give the kids to try equalize stuff, you know. You cannot give everybody bikes because otherwise you would need, I don't know how many bikes. But to give them, to give them uh, those children opportunity to be equal to, to, to their, uh, you know, mates in the school, to have a new bike, not some lumpy old, you know, broken old bike. And maybe some of those would because of that bike they would try cycling they would try uh, road racing i don't know ultra cycling maybe someday and i can tell you the feeling when you give out the bike to a child who doesn't expect to get it that's that's far you know that's one one location in i don't know murska sovot i don't know where it is but uh -huh. anyway there, there's a there's a child who didn't four of them knew that they were giving they will get bikes the fifth did not know that he would get a bike, but the guy, the guy had this um, uh, disease with his uh, spine. You know, I don't know if, if it's called also English scoliosis or something like that. He he would need uh, a special a special uh, braces for for the back because he was growing. I don't know too fast. I don't know exactly what's wrong with it. But he and his mother was riding bicycles to school every day, ten kilometers. Uh, and then uh, he was having this old bike. I don't know where he got it, but when we gave him uh, the new bike, he was like so happy that you know you just don't understand it. He was so happy, like you would give him the whole world. You know, he was just screaming, "I got a new bike! I got a new bike!" And he was so happy, and that's that's worth it. And but we our funds were limited, and we could not. We were not so aggressive. Let's say with the media and stuff uh, like that, because I don't know how it's on the other sides of the world, but in our country, let's say a certain television station would pick up uh, their own uh, charity, and at the end you get this feeling that they are promoting themselves uh, through the charity, not trying to get a lot of stuff through charity. 
when we, you were proposing them to, to back up your action, they would not even publish the news. When you were giving out five bikes, they would not even publish that news that you gave out five bikes in that, in that town. So that's why we stopped. You know, it's, but uh, we tried, and the local, uh, the local uh, distributor for Scott Bikes was actually supporting us, giving us bikes, I don't know, half the price. Uh, the same, the same guys who were sponsoring, which were sponsoring you during the races. So they, we stayed together with that. So they are, Incredible. they are, they were doing that uh, in the name of Yure. That's that's such an awesome legacy for him to leave behind. That influence that he's had over your life, his sponsors' lives, to be able to do this to bless and empower others to to strive after things that he did so well and so he definitely lives on and i know even the ram president friend fred bothling wrote a tribute to yuri and it was titled yuri's gift to the sport where he talks about even amongst all of yuri's incredible accomplishments 150 podium finishes five ram wins perhaps that in his death he may have made his greatest contribution, which Fred had summarized very well towards the end. Someone commented on what a productive conversation we had and that we need to meet more often. So there were people like Christoph Strausser, different race owners and directors that had met there to attend his funeral. And Fred says that he had been aiming for this sort of thing for several years. So what really struck home for Fred was that with Yuri's parting gift to the sport and to all of us as ultra athletes and ultra family, he not only raised the bar for all of us as athletes, but he also brought us all together to improve the sport. And so you were just talking about how Yuri and his legacy has brought together a diverse set of people and organizations to donate bicycles but he's also brought together yourself and myself here today to talk about the influence that he's had on the sport, on your life, on the lives of people there in Slovenia and people who follow the race across America. And so it's such an incredible legacy that he's left. I'd love to know, Matt, in closing, what Yure's life meant to you, his accomplishments, your friendship with him. What legacy did he leave behind for you? one of the toughest questions you know at first i would say that i had you know when people are asking me once during i don't know which third race across america some film crew was were asking me why are you doing this all over again year by year and i don't know till today i don't know why and i guess that's his influence you know he was he was actually very simple guy not complicated on uh, he was just you know riding the bicycle wanted to win the race across america full on when you start to start you know the, the race is really simple you know when people are asking me how is the race across america you start on one beach and you finish on the other beach the beach is that this america is really long wide and it's race is really simple yuri was really simple and you just, you know, we were charmed by by the simplicity of of the way he did this, those races. He was just, he was just racing, no, no complications, no nothing. He was just, he was just racing, and we just wanted to be, I don't know, part of that story. But after he died, I don't know. I've been places which I have, will, would not be if without him. Uh, the experience of race across America, crewing the race across America, you cannot get that experience out of any business school, out of any, I don't know, school, whatever, training camp, whatever you go to. You will never, you know, see how the crew, the race across America crew works day in, day out and win at the end. You know, the, 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 actually for us, when you won the race, we were winning the race. No, we were it was not i don't know the crew cannot win your races but they can lose the races for you but we our feeling of winning was with him 
when he won, we won the races. And I don't know. That experience of doing that the way he did it, it's probably what, what stayed with me. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. A simple man, but a fierce competitor for sure. Yeah. Like an animal, you know. Mm -hmm. He was called he was called many names, you know. He was he was like an you know, very simple. When he was really a gentle giant when out off races, but mm. he changed when the, the race started. So mm. Yuri Robic was definitely a man for the history books. Super accomplished, had a great team that came back year after year. You came back seven times. You helped him be successful, but it sounds like Yure helped you and many others in the ultra cycling family to be successful in their own ways. And so he's left a lasting legacy and a lasting impression for all of us to see and to read about for future generations. So Matt, I really appreciate you taking the time today to share your friendship, your time with Yure, all of your knowledge, your fun memories, all the challenges, all the adventures. I'm sure it was some of the times of your life. And so I hope that for everyone watching, that they've learned a lot, that they've been inspired by the story of Yure's life that you've been able to share with us. And we hope that his legacy can keep living strong through your life as his last crew chief and through his son. And we'll look forward to seeing his son take the baton in whatever way that he does in mountain biking, enduro racing, or whatever the case may be. But I'm sure that he's glad to have you there with him, a very close friend of his father. So Matt, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for taking the time to commemorate Yuri Robich's life and his incredible career as an ultra endurance cyclist and one of the greatest Ram racers ever. Thank you for, uh, giving me opportunity to tell the stories it has been a long time ago but you know memories are still quite fresh some of them so it was fun well everyone at home i hope you enjoyed this episode hope you learned something that you didn't know yet about yuri and if you haven't watched the ram documentary bicycle dreams check that out Yuri is also featured in there, and I'm sure it will inspire you to reach for your dreams and your goals. And, and I hope that out of this, you were able to learn something to help you achieve your goals. And maybe one day we'll see you at the starting line of Race Across America. So until the next episode, keep spinning ultra.